Hi, this is Misha. And this is Jay. And this is the second half of our May, I guess, COVID special extended long Q&A. We really do appreciate all the questions yeah, and, the, and, the, and the dollar donations. As we usually mention, you, you know, we have a Patreon. Honestly, we set it up because of people wanting us to. And, you know, a dollar and up, you can submit as many questions and we do these every two to three months mm -hmm. as, as time permits yeah so this one was a big one as we said the first half over 60 questions we knocked out about the first 30 and now we're going to knock out the, the last 30. yep and uh, i mentioned that video as well i'll mention in this one too um if you want to put timestamps in the video we'll have in the description the list of questions that were asked um, and if you're watching this through for the first time and want to take down the timestamps, I'll pin them in the top of the comments. Um, like I said, also, that's not really feasible for us to do right now. Um, so just an FYI on that. I am saying very slowly as I try to get the list of questions pulled up to read. How's everybody doing? Okay. How is that ice cream you're in again? Yeah, uh, it was pretty good. Yeah, get it off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> from a couple days ago when I ran down the road to find the ice cream truck. It took a while. Alrighty, first question. Dan says, has Misha considered writing a book on the history of AK importation in the USA? One of the things that sets this channel apart is Misha's knowledge of legal of the legal machinations, which I find fascinating. I appreciate the vote of confidence, but I really don't feel like I'm enough of an expert and have enough sources and everything. Plus, I don't know books in 2020 i mean i guess ebooks but sure it, a lot of books tend to be more picture oriented and uh, it's not really my thing yeah yeah sense. yeah so you're just doing all that stuff on youtube instead yep yeah it's kind of nice because you can say whatever bs you want to and you have to cite any of your sources and you don't have to do publishers and you don't have to worry about revisions and all sure. it, it, getting a book published is a headache in some ways, it's easier than it used to be, but in other ways, I don't know, small press publishing can be a... Yeah. Yeah. Makes mm -hmm. sense. Uh, Matt says, hey guys, great channel, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you thought, thought the time and effort spent by top-tier militaries to develop a full-size self-loading rifle was well spent, or would they have been better off skipping them altogether and allocating similar resources to submachine guns? I feel like even... Even the limited use of the MP-18, warts and all, should have been more instructive to the armies of the era. They had direct knowledge that combat was not occurring at standoff distances of a thousand yards, and yet they kept pursuing rifles that could technically reach out that far. Um, what would more development of subguns have gotten us to modern? Inter would this? Sorry, let me start over. Would more development of subguns have gotten us to modern intermediate caliber cartridges faster? Most of the full-size rifles that were developed had capacities of ten rounds or less and most still required strippers, clip, slash in blocks, which was not as fast as a magazine change. It feels like, especially in Germany's case, the G43 was a bit, a bit of a dead end, which was needlessly developed in parallel to the MKB-42. Thanks and be well. Okay, again, this could be a whole video in and of itself, but yeah, I had it out here, so this is Yugo N56, which is their variant of a uh, MP40 made after the war. And I brought out my SVT-40 because I think most people think of things like the M1 Garand or, at the very least, yeah, the G43. But this is another one, and there's a wall that really is, it was instructive, although the gun itself could be considered a failure. The MP-18, while it had promise in World War I, it had limitations too. They had feeding issues, they didn't really have the magazines down right, and you gotta remember, World War I was fought, even if at closer ranges on an open battlefield where a submachine gun is of relatively limited utility. Mm -hmm. And they weren't really doing folding stocks yet. Um, on the other hand, after the war, there was the Great Depression and all the economic troubles. And at the same, so militaries saw their budgets cut and they had millions of rounds of eight mil, 30 out six, whatever. They had all the existing rifles. So economics definitely plays a part. As you know, the 
you know, the M1 Grand, they were hoping to chamber it in a smaller diameter cartridge, it was almost like an intermediate, but really the fact that America had so much 30-06, not to mention interoperability with 1919 and other guns, mm -hmm. they, they stuck with it. Oh yeah, this is a, this is a big one. I I'll, I'll just say this: I don't the the self-loading rifle phage is so much taught. Like the SVT there, I think without the learning experiences from it, the AK or even the SKS could not have been what they ended up being. They learned a lot through that phase, and obviously the M1 Garand served America well during two major wars in other nations too. Sometimes you can't just leapfrog, and of course looking in hindsight, but yeah. And yeah, the M1 Grand was in block, but that was kind of a thing. At the same time, magazines, mass production, you gotta remember stamped, the stamping technology of the 1920s and 30s isn't like it is today. So the magazines were by volume more expensive to produce. They would issue three with the SVT, but they would encourage soldiers to use stripper clips to load them unless they needed to. So they were getting there. I do agree that the G43 was kind of a dead end since the MP44, but Germany was like that in World War II. They, they hedged their bet. They had several competing and ongoing programs, and the G43 was supposed to be the, the Mauser's replacement, whereas the MP44, nominally the MP40's replacement, maybe, but they couldn't quite figure out. It's funny, today we look at an, a, a quote-unquote storm rifle, assault rifle, and we see all these uses, but in 1942 Germany, they weren't sure what it could be used for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a whole thing, but no, I, I think that was an important step. And I think the fact that a lot of M1 Grands and Carbines stayed in service through the 50s and 60s shows you that they were still a valid gun. I mean, heck, sure. even post-war you had guns like the FN-49 being developed. Yeah. So. Uh, Lucian says, hey guys, hope all is well. As far as I can tell, most of Arsenal's, let me aim a little closer to the microphone here. As far as I can tell, most of Arsenal's products are based on Bulgarian semi-auto versions mm -hmm. of their military product line, like the ARM, uh, sorry, ARM1 and M2, etc. Mm -hmm. Is the SLR 106 UR based on a military variant, or was it developed strictly strictly for commercial sales as a 556 crank? If so, was it adopted by Bulgaria or any military? I'd be interested to see how it was received with such a short barrel and 556 being so velocity dependent versus five four five impressive ballistics out of short barrels due to bullet design. Uh, thanks again for the content, guys. Thanks, Lucian. They did play around with some five five six stamped receiver crank types in Bulgaria, but of course they ended up going with the milled gun, which is like the Sam Seven K, the AR M four, and a few others. So in a modern sense, no, they don't do a stamped 5.56 crank, but it was experimented with. And of course you have guns like the Yugoslavian and today Serbian M85, which immediately have a little bit longer barrel. But, you know, 5.56, especially heavier weights with a faster twist, performs better than you might think out of an eight, eight and a half inch barrel. It was really the older, 55 grain with the 1 in 12 twist that really did poorly for pretty obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But no, uh, the, the, pretty much all of Arsenal's stamped line, even the 104F are, were, were civilian market guns. They, they, for military customers, are pretty much all milled all the time. Yeah. But that's not to say that it's not a pretty quality military gun because this is a 545 crank just in 556. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Darren says, I feel like it's almost a tradition for me to ask about the Bryn 2 in these Q&As, so here we go. And I didn't bring out the Bryn 2 this time. You'll know when I finally get one because I'll shut up about them. <laughs> or you'll talk more about them, who knows. Uh, I'm now waiting for the Bryn 2 carbine. Do you know if the new B2 carbine cold, cold hammer forged barrel is chrome lined or nitride? I can't seem to find the answer. I'm thinking it's chrome, but I can't find it specifically stated anywhere. Thanks. So, do, do you know if the pistols had chrome lining? 
The pistols are, yeah. Yeah, pistols are chrome lined. I, I'm gonna jump, this isn't your question, but a lot of people are waiting on the carbine. I wouldn't, um, just me, because the neat thing about the Bryn 2 over the 805 is it's light. It's just over six pounds. It looks like the Bryn 2 carbine is gonna weigh 7.2 to 7.3 pounds. So kind of splitting the difference between the two. That longer barrel, which seems to have a slightly heavier profile, and the longer handguard and thus longer gas piston are kind of adding back weight that CZ in Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, sorry, uh, took off for a reason. Mm -hmm. So I just, plus I just don't care for the look as much. I think the 11 inch Bryn 2 is just, it's how that gun should look. Yeah. Personal we, opinion. We know that the S, the two MS pistols are, I don't see why they wouldn't chrome line. But it depends if hard. the barrel's made here or there. That's the thing. Okay. If they're made here, it's like with the 805, the pistol barrels were 14 by 1, but then the carbine barrels were half by 28. So sure. sometimes they do Americanize things. Yep. Yes. So we don't know for sure. It's not out yet. And CZ has been really bizarre, but the whole Bryn 2 thing. Yeah, it's it's been hard to get any like real... For one, any definite information that doesn't then immediately change... Mm -hmm. later on down the road for some reason so uh james says hey guys got a slightly different than normal question for you um do you think we will see a wave of pump shotguns being turned in post covid or do you think we'll see a bunch of new gun owners looking to get deeper into the hobby what do you think uh i think if my experience with gun owners um mainly like my family is this way um parents, grandparents, etc., were basically you have a gun for a purpose. So mm -hmm. you have your hunting shotgun and you have your hunting rifle and those stay in a zipped up case in a closet until it's time to go hunting and um, you, you uh, between that you never take it out or think about it. And I tend to think that most of these people who have bought a shotgun for home defense, you know, with panic stuff happening I, my personal opinion is probably most of these people will do something similar. They'll, they have their shotgun, they have the box of ammunition that they bought for it. They're gonna put it in the 10 gun gun locker that they bought when they bought their shotgun and put it in there and lock it up and just completely forget about it. That's, that's my assumption with most of these. I don't think they're gonna, there's gonna be a tremendous wave of people selling them since they already have them. I think they're just gonna have them. Um, I, think, I think it is gonna get has a good chance of getting pe some people into the hobby, um, personally, but I don't, I don't know how widespread that's going to be. I, I, it's interesting to me to think that people were buying these shotguns <laughs> and the motivation behind why they're buying shotguns instead of a rifle or a handgun. And, um, so I wonder how much of that, especially if people are new to shooting, how much of shooting a 12 gauge, especially full power defense loads is really going to lead people to want to shoot guns more often. Don't know. Yeah, it's the future. I think there will there will be some, but yep, I think there will be some. I, I I I'm also hopeful it'll get some people into guns. I think the ones who bought ARs and stuff are more likely the shotgun yep. group. Yeah, and people maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe not the thirty eight. Not the people who bought the three fifty seven air weights. <laughs> and you know whatever. Yeah, I yeah I, I don't know. It's it's the future. Yep. And it probably depends how the political situation goes the rest of the year. Yep, that too. Uh, Gregory says, Hey, Misha, appreciate the hard work you and Jay put in the channel. How do you ev evaluate a firearms condition, especially mill serps and older guns, and what do you, what things do you look out for? Again, this is kind of a big question. Um, I would say the first thing, first and foremost, has it been bubbified? Has it been sporterized? Yep. Has the stock been cut on? If not, has it been sanded? That's something yep. I go for. Next I see, is the metal finish original? Is it refurbished in the military? Or is it, again, re-blued by Bubba? Yep. Following that, looking at smaller things, has th does all the parts that are on it look correct? Or have they been swapped out? Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously bore condition not really much i can do but luckily honestly as much as people talk about it 
it doesn't seem to be that big of a deal, really. Yep. You just hedge your bets, and if you think it's a great bore, you say it's a good bore, and vice, you know, go on from there. Yeah. Obviously, I check mechanical function. I the safety is a big deal. Making sure the safety works. Yeah. Uh, magazines, if if it if it's a mag gun, make sure those things like that. You know, usual stuff. And I, of course, you always want to look for import marks. Yeah. Yeah, serial matching or yeah. not, if it's necessary. And even if you know, even if you don't care about the serials, usually if your bolt matches your receiver, you know the headspace is probably pretty good. That kind of stuff. So yeah. there's other reasons besides collectability to, to focus on serials. Sure. Uh, Matt asks, will we ever see FB Radom RPK barrels? No, because FB Radom has never made the RPK. Yeah. They made the RPD, and that's pretty much it. If you saw a quote-unquote Polish RPK, it was mislabeled because there was that batch of Century M64s that were briefly sold as quote-unquote Polish, but they had Romanian markings on the trunnion, and again, the Romanian name for the RPK is the PM64, so yeah. it was just a typo on a website, and it kind of started this thing about Polish art. No, they, they did not make them. They got a few hundred or whatever from Russia or whoever and tried them out, but they never made their own. Sure. So they're not going to tool up to make a substantially different barrel no. just to make a few for us. No, they haven't. They haven't been... Like even just getting guns, some auto versions of guns they do make has been extremely difficult. So yeah, um, Kason says, "Hey guys, thanks for all the content and keep up the great work. Thank you, Kason." Um, question number one: Do you think H and K will ever release a semi-auto braced, or readily convertible, no-stock version of the MP7 PDW for the U.S. market? And would you buy one? Uh, do I think they will? No. Would I buy one? Generally, yes, yes. unless the price is crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would also try to get one. If they weren't, if they weren't much over two two thousand or twenty two hundred, I would probably buy one. I just, I mean, look how much demand there's been for an MP five and how long it took them yeah. to do the SP five, and that's a pretty wide appeal with a very common caliber. Yeah, MP seven is going to be a very narrow market, and HK is not really into that. Yep. So unfortunately, I don't think so. But if they did, yeah, I'm generally speaking, buy yeah, one. TP nine's close enough. <laughs> um, two, second question. What are some guns in which we have access to today which are seen as nothing special but might surprise us as being thought of as collectible in the future? We did a video on like guns that are underappreciated today and that's a pretty good list of things that we kind of identified. I think the, the low hanging fruit right now is any, any import rifle. Yeah, specifically AKs. Yes. Um, I would even go so far as to say any kit gun, if it's a matching kit, especially original barrel, sure. those have been going yep. pretty gangbusters. I would also say, I mean, they've been uh, Colts to some extent, Colt AR-15s. I think they definitely have received, but I, 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 depending on their company future, people might be like, oh, you could actually buy a real M4. Yeah. Likewise, some of the retro guns, places like Troy and Brownells have yeah. done. I mean, who knows how many they actually might build. Right. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, it, the thing is right now so many guns are appreciated. Um, yeah. Even like Mosin's have finally gotten a lot of uh, traction. <laughs> I think you could almost just say semi-auto rifles. Yeah, I mean, in general. Any kind of semi-auto rifle right now is probably not appreciated and may be may, people may wish they could get them in the future I don't know. yeah without knowing the the f future of these companies it, it's really hard to say companies but. import laws import mm -hmm. restrictions parts availability you know whatever it happens to be uh third question any thoughts on the new Ruger 57? Have either of you handled one? Do you think Ruger has a PS90 competitor in the works now? Nope, never handled one, don't have one, never never really thought about it, right? Nope, not yeah. at all. Um, He's been playing with that all day. All day. <laughs> all day. <laughs> yeah, um, seems cool. I mean, we haven't shot it yet. We literally just came into the shop, um, and we opened the box and took a look at it. I've been disassembling it and reassembling it for fun. Um, I like the assembly on it. The trigger seems all right. A little, little creepy, not great. Maybe not as good as an FN57, but uh, seems fine. Um, fit is okay, but I'll do a 
longer range trip and first impressions video on it yep. this week. So I did own a 5.7 in the past, sold it. Um, it well, yeah, so yeah, I'll when we shoot it, I'll try to remember my impressions of the 5.7 best I can. Yeah. But so far, cool. It's yeah. like a 5.7, it's a little bit better in some areas, a little bit not as good, but half the price, so right. can't sneeze at that. Yeah, so stay tuned for that uh, this week. And then the other thing is, um, do we think that Ruger will be making a PS90 competitor? I think so. I mean, maybe not a direct bullpup, but a, yeah. a, a carbine, they're already doing the gun, they're already making the mags, and sure. Ruger has been pretty good about doing carbine versions yeah. of things. Or pistol versions of carbines that they make. I mean, yeah. a lot of, like, the Charger, the new the new Charger, the 9mm Charger, is basically a Ruger PC9 takedown, but mm -hmm. with a short barrel and no stock. Um, and then they've done that with their 1022s and all that stuff before. So I think it's totally feasible that they could make a carbine, a blowback carbine, maybe a PC style, um, maybe a takedown style that uses 5.7 mags, or 57 mags, I should say. Um, yeah. Let me see that reader totally for a second. I'm curious about something. Really, enough, it's an internal hammer. Yeah, this is what you said blowback what got me thinking. The funny thing is the 5.7 and this too, along with the PS90, are not straight blowback guns. They are delayed. Notice the barrel moves. So there's a small amount of lock breaching, oh, at least okay. delay cool. going on. That's because that, that cartridge is still a pistol round, but it's a little bit potent. Yeah. So they all have a little bit of delayed blowback going on in them. Yeah, interesting setup. I'm, I'm very, mm -hmm. very interested in uh, shooting it. So. Yep, I, it, it might be a question of what which platform they, they decide to go with 5.7 in, but yeah, I think they could and should sure. if they're doing it. Why not? Yep, and it seems like they've been really popular. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was difficult. I, I was telling you, it feels like it's been like two months that I've been trying to get one of these, um, and I didn't pay much of a early adopter fee. I didn't no. pay over MSRP for it, but um, a lot of people are, and a lot of places are charging over MSRP for them, which I think is ridiculous. But... Um, yeah, I think the popularity and the, as much pe as people are buying them, then I think they seems like they'll have some commercial incentive to mm -hmm. make a carbine if they wanted to. Uh, so, Kaysen's fourth question. A PSA rep had mentioned the potential to work on an SVD clone at this year's SHOT Show. Is this just marketing hype for the PSA brand, or do you think PSA could eventually pull off building such a rifle? Do you think they might try to pull a fast one and go the PSL-esque upscaled AK route instead of trying to reverse engineer a legit SVD or NDM-86? Um, the thing is, people say reps say things, but a lot of times they say things in response to a question, and I'd have to go back and look at the SHOT Show. I don't know if PSA rep just voluntarily said, hey, we're gonna do an SVD or we're looking at, or did someone ask them, hey, are you looking into doing an SVD? And he said, yes, anything's or possible. anything's possible. Yeah. So there's a big difference there. But assuming that they tried, yes, it would be an upscaled yeah. AK because SVDs on a milled receiver, uh, mechanically, totally different. Actually, it's a lot more like this uh, VZ58 here it's not the same, but it's more like it really than an AK. The investment in resources to do it and do it correctly. Yeah. Plus again, they don't have the specs, so they would have to reverse engineer a lot of stuff. Right. It would be so expensive. And what market are they going for? Right. Real collectors want Russian or nothing. Yeah. Yeah, so it, they would be smart if they decided to do it, to just upscale an AK and do it in 54R yeah. and yeah, 308. Yeah, put a PSL competitor out. And yeah. Well, the, uh, the Zestava M91, even though it's pretty good and damn expensive, seems to be doing well yeah. for what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Last question. Thanks again, guys. Hey, no problem, man. Like, if you guys want to ask multiple questions, that's that's cool. We're we blocked off this entire day. So. Yes, we yeah. blocked off a day to answer these. We actually gave up a day of shooting to answer your yes, questions. That's true. Yep. Um, if, and happy to do it. If you could go back in time to show a shooter from 1900 a firearm produced today or in the recent That past. was the one. Yes. That was the other one I was saying. I was telling him there's one question I wanted to get a weird gun out. Right, there we go. <laughs> Which would lead him to believe to you to be some sort of mad scientist turned gun dealer because it's so different from anything he would hmm. be familiar with. What would it be? What do you think? Uh, I, the first thing I thought of was a PS90. So, that or would be weird. A P90. Yeah. Um, so like an actual full auto... 
um, 50 round capacity, super weird, futuristically looking plastic shell, plastic magazines, like controllable full auto. So most people in 1900 at that point would be used to something like a Maxim gun or something along those lines. So a small hand operated, um, very compact, lightweight, full auto <laughs> plastic space gun, I think would be extremely, um, even, I think even if, if you go back to people probably even right before the P90 came out, that gun probably looked like something that was alien. So. Yep. Yeah, I think anything that was plastic and not wood um, would, would kind of, I mean, uh, the AUG is another easy one. Yep. Any, any bullpup, really. Um, even, even like the G36, even though it's a very conventional rifle today, pretty much nothing about the G36 would be identifiable to someone of that era. Yep. Yeah, even, you know, to a certain extent, pistol grip on rifle <laughs> is uh, you know, another, an advancement. Another weird one for them would be, and even today, is the uh, the, the Chris Vector. Oh, yeah, sure. That is a just a funky-looking gun. Yeah, and what's funny is it's just blowback. It's just a blowback-operated gun. It just works differently than anything else. Yeah, it just looks weird and different. So, yeah, any, anything polymery, I think, would, would really blow their minds. Yep. Um, Michael says, thank you for all the good information you two have put out over the years, guys. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, I had a few questions for you folks. One, do you think the post-World War II Walther P-38s were made better than the World War II P-38s? Oh, that, that's a long range. I mean, if you're talking late war, yeah. But, you know, in World War II era, early war, they're, they're steel frame versus alloy. Mm -hmm. I think... I think fit and finish is probably better post-war, but I think durability of parts is probably better early war. Because when they made them in the 60s, there was a certain economy of scale. They, they, they were trying to use new manufacturing techniques to keep costs reasonable. In 1939, 1940, not so much concern. And those early P-38s have some really pretty blowing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Depends how you look at it, but uh, they, they were they were always made for military police, so they were never show guns. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. Second question: Would you consider the Romine SAR one and SAR two AK rifles the closest thing the civilian market will get to an actual AKM rifle? Yeah, I mean the only other competition really is of course the mod e the arm either a, a pre-band or like an early, early post ban like a intrac mm -hmm. they uh, yeah they're both really close the the only thing you could say about the sar it's a phosphate finish whereas the russian was a paint over phosphate and the mod e is and most russians guns didn't have the scope rail but the sar does gotcha. but some some did but yeah, it's it's up there. It's it's in the, the the two, and you could kind of argue which is more authentic. Each has kind of pros and cons. But uh, third question: What is your opinion of the Century AK sixty three DS underfolder rifle? It's a stamped receiver underfolder part receiver underfolder yep. parts kit. Man, that's hard to say. Built with a Hungarian AK parts kit. When you do hear about the AK sixty three rifles, it's usually the D version or the milled version. Thanks again, Misha and Jay. Yeah, they, they did the mill the, the, for a long time because Century went through this phase years back where everything they did was on a milled receiver, even if it shouldn't have been. Then they finally introduced a stamped receiver for it. I definitely think the stamped are better than the mill because the mill guns are on Century milled receivers, thus the front quote-unquote trunnion area is Century. At least when you get the stamped gun, you're getting a, um, a real FEG front trunnion yeah. and a real FEG bolt. Century stamped receivers have historically been fine. So the only questionable part would be the barrel, and they use Green Mountain barrels, which are fine. Yeah. I mean, nothing against them. They're not going to blow up on you. So, yeah, um, typical kit build. I, Yeah, I mean, assuming the monkey was having a good day, um, crush the rivets right, headspace is good. Yeah, I mean, they're they're fine. Yeah, they're just they're typical. When Century does kit builds, usually they're pretty good yeah, yeah. You can go either way yeah 
Uh, Ryan says, I have a Waffenworks 74 2013 production. I'm sorry. It says it has a chrome line barrel, ESS I believe. It's built on a matching Bulgarian kit. Should I shoot that barrel out or just shelve it until I have the tools to build it on a better receiver and barrel? Man, I keep saying it. Receiver and barrel. I'd shoot it. I mean, it, when those Waffenworks receivers are giving out, they give clear signs. So as long as you're mindful of what your gun's doing, yeah. might as well shoot it. I mean, the barrel, I, again, that might have been Green Mountain. I don't know who did those, but they're U.S. made, but the barrel's fine. It, the, the suspect part was the receiver, and, and you'll know... Yeah, again, not a lawyer, not a gunsmith, but if you're observant, you'll see signs like cases bulging, extra gas blowing back, you know, uh, warping this part and that part, and of course, headspace going. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a field gauge, I'd pick up a field gauge and shoot it, but I'd, I'd shoot it if you want to. Yeah. Um, also, I have an SLR 104 FR with an AKT trigger. I did a rifle dynamics AK build class, and they said that trigger will break against the trigger guard rivet. The rivet appears to be deforming. Should I replace mm -hmm. the trigger or, ju or just put a flatter rivet in? Thanks. I wouldn't mess with a rivet on a gun that's not collectible. My opinion is pretty straightforward with such guns. Just get a military type trigger. I don't like these modern match triggers P people are putting in AKs because they're not mil spec and therefore they don't interface properly like you're talking here it's probably a cosmetic thing but it's not a $900 gun anymore that's a $1,900 gun right I wouldn't again I'd just put a regular military trigger in it yeah. just me but I, I like AKTs just fine but if if I had a trigger that was damaging I like Tapco G2s just fine but if I have a trigger that's damaging a rifle, I'm going to pull the trigger out and put a different trigger in. So yeah, I don't know what's in your Waffenworks, but if it's the original, you might swap those two around. Because is that in the Waffenworks gun wouldn't bug me, because it's a U.S. receiver and rivet. But yeah, there you go. Yeah, but in a gun like that, I, I wouldn't. Just me. Uh, Dan says, was there an overarching logic to Colt's model numbering system for its AR variants, in particular the 600 and 700 series? In other words, does the model number reflect the rifle's features or domestic slash import variant, etc., or the number is just sort of an arbitrary, sort of arbitrary, as seems to be the case with Glock model numbers? Thanks. See, first off, I don't find Glock models arbitrary. I mean, they're pretty much just assigned based on when Glock made that gun. But either way, no, there, there's a logic to Colt. For example, the uh, you know the 603 was the first to be one thing, and the 604 was with, and they kind of do pairs. They'll for a long time they would do with and without forward assist. Like, for example, the 629 is the the XM177 forward assist, the X, the, and the 630 is the same gun without. And then they would do the exports versions, the, the 639 and the 640. And so if you follow the logic, it, it really does exist. There's definitely a pattern. I would suggest maybe looking at a spreadsheet of all the model numbers and features and it'll, it'll kind of jump out at you. Start to yeah, you'll start to see, okay, well, nine means this. There's not. It's not like Smith & Wesson where the numbers straight up translate to something. Right. But there's a, there's, a, there's a method to their madness. So I, I kind of, I wonder if some of the confusion, because I, I actually was looking at this question, I was like, yeah, that's actually a good point. What do those, those mean? But you explaining it in that you have iterations of a particular series, mm -hmm. but if you don't have that, those iterations all laid out in front of you yeah it seems totally random that this gun's a 601 and this gun's a 780 or whatever yeah like the, the 600s are pretty much your 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 a1 generation your 700s are when you're getting into the a2 and the early m4s and yeah. then your 900s are pretty much your flat tops of today yeah but if you're looking at yeah. it from just a major variant standpoint then yeah those model numbers are going to be all over the place yeah <laughs> yeah you really need because cole has a lot of models that either maybe weren't made in big numbers or again where Pretty much the same gun, but through military reasoning, they needed to make a quote-unquote export version. Mm. And usually that just means either a slightly different barrel length or just even just different markings. Oh, and another one, uh, when they got into three-round burst, they still kept making all those guns in full auto option, you know, so say semi-full. Yeah. So a lot of times you'll start to see companion guns, one being the three-round and one being the, the full auto gun. So mm. the difference could just be trigger pack. Like, for example, the 920 versus the 921. Yeah. 
And then they will add HB. I'll let you guess what that stands for. When they start doing, you know, A1 profile barrels. Do you want me to guess? Or are you going to literally having them guess? I don't know. HB, heavy barrel? Put your best guess of what <laughs> HB means in the comments below. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I would suggest maybe just looking at it, and then it'll kind of start to flow a little bit. Mattman84, who's uh, somebody actually signed up for the Patreon just for this Q&A, so thanks, Matt. <laughs> um, what is your opinion on one of the new CSA VZ58 rifles, and are they worth the one to $1,200? Also, do you think a time is going to come when all the parts kits for various guns are going to dry up. Uh, thanks, appreciate all the hard work you guys do and the content you provide. Thank you, Matt. Okay, question two first. Yep. That time is pretty much now yeah, and has now. been. The, cat, the parts kits are drying up. Yeah. There's only so many overseas and even some others that are over there, they're in countries where we can't get them out of. In fact, mm -hmm. there was a big deal about some Russian AKM kits that weren't in Russia. They were in a European country that I won't disclose. Mm -hmm. And there was a big push to get those imported. But because of their Russian connections, they got folded into the sanctions. Mm -hmm. So they'll probably eventually just get torched. Yeah. So even if the kits are over there, you have to be from a country that essentially we like. It's just like anything else, um, whether it's kits or mill serps or whatever, they're not making these guns anymore. Right. So uh, there's a finite number. It's like Mosin's, Mosin the Gods. They made, what, 12 or 14 million of them? 30 million total. 30 million total. And yeah. <laughs> um, those, are, I mean, there was a time when people would just grab those, one of those, and chop them up because they were cheap and they could. Um, I told you that story a about barrel of Moses. I told you that story about the guy who used to use M forty fours to make lamps out of. There you go. So <laughs> if it's so yeah, all the stuff is finite, and it's all going to it's just going to keep getting, if, uh, not maybe not necessarily every day, but pretty much every day the stuff's just going to keep getting more expensive. Right. So because it's the 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 scarcity of it is just going to continue. And as for this gun, you have no first idea. Question. Yeah, the first question: How? First of all, how long I waited for a Czech semi-auto BZ-58 to come in and how thrilled I was when the first D-Technics came in, in in 2007. Yes, I think these guns are worth every bit of $1,200. I mean, milled receiver, and this isn't some weird cat. This is a real milled receiver, short stroke piston, takes military mags. Uh, this one has the original cold hammer forge chrome lined uh, 15 and a half inch barrel that's why this is permanently attached mm -hmm. but you know even the newer ones they have the the walther 16 inch barrels which have the removable muzzle device so it's kind of a but it's still a good barrel mm -hmm. you can put whatever furniture on them they are so smooth yep. nice triggers relatively underappreciated fires a, a pretty standard ish cartridge i mean 76239 is Maybe not as popular as 223, although they do make a 223 version of this. No, no, no. They, they've been uh, a sleeper gun, and uh, they, they were imported by a relatively small company. They're made by a relatively small company. They are worth every bit. If someone was wanting a milled arsenal and missed out, check out the VZ-58 yeah. if you can get one. They're awesome. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, it, if... So I mean, Robski was super happy. I mean, I think you, he, I think he even said you talked him into getting one. Yeah, I did. Um, it worked. What What was his hang up? Were the mags? And I get it. Sure. I get it. It takes its own mags. They're good mags, yeah. and they're not super expensive. But it does not take AK mags. And but he kept saying, bolt "Hold open, right? They're, they're bolt and they're alloy." And what's weird is most alloy mags, you get them and they're dented up. These yeah. mags, even though they're alloy, they seem to be really damn tough. Yeah. And AR mags are alloy, so don't let that, you know. But yeah, they they have last round hold open, automatic, and manual, which is something the AK doesn't. And yeah, you know how Rob liked it, but his thing was he had to get ten mags. But the thing is, you can get ten mags for under three hundred dollars, and the guns do come with two, so you get a couple, and they do come with a sling and a cleaning kit. And uh, yeah, Checkpoint USA is a pretty they have they have high standards. They're not. They're not a big. They're not century arms. Yeah. They're, they're they're no. If you yeah, definitely. Yeah, the fit and finish is really good. I to put this in perspective. He's, he mentioned um, waiting a long time for one, um, but even after they came out, because they're limited, typically pretty limited batches that come in. I had the homepage from the browser on my hmm. phone set to 
the their page on um, VZ58s. So that way, every time I opened the internet on my phone, I immediately saw it, what they had in stock and what they didn't. So basically, within a few minutes of them getting in stock, I ordered one. Because oh, and one thing I'll say with customers, you know, most of the ones you get have the, the modern black polymer furniture, either traditional or, or... You can get that, and you can easily find a set of Czech military furniture, and it drops right on. In fact, I think yeah, you bought yours. You, you just brought yours out of the Czech Republic, right? Yeah, yeah I bought it on eBay. Um, the guy selling it on eBay had... A full set of the Beaver Bar furniture and uh, a Slim Jim furniture all together for like two hundred bucks. Yeah. So and so now I've got that plus a full set of Black Palmer furniture. And and the, and the Black Palmer is probably it's, more it's practical. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It's, 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 nice it's, it's 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 not it's not Tapco. It's not ATI. It, it's actually I don't want to say military, but it's military grade and then mako and stuff like makes a bunch of rail hand guards and but yeah i, I get that a lot because because the, the newer looking ones are, are easier to get but people don't really want those they want the yeah. beaver bar for the wood like this one like yeah. get what you can get and get the furniture and put it on later sure. it's easy no mods required uh brian says uh love your channel and was wondering what your opinion on the norinco 84 series is it basically a 56 but only chambered in 223 being that there are not a lot of options for the 545, do you think the 556 is going to increase in its popularity among AK enthusiasts? Thank you both for the excellent content you provide. Thanks, Brian. I love it when people answer their own questions. <laughs> yeah, the first half, yes, the, the, the Type 84S is a Type 56S, but in 223, 556 NATO. Of course, it, take, it takes its own mags. Yep. And it has a birdcage flash rider, kind of, it's not an M16A1, but inspired by, but otherwise, yeah. And it's as good. I mean, they're, kind of wish I owned one, but the prices are gone a little nutty. They are mostly a commercial gun. They weren't used by the Chinese military, mm -hmm. but so what? They're, they're, they're good guns, but yeah, they're, they're 56S. Yeah. Uh, let's see, uh, as far as 5.56, I don't know. Um, it was really gaining a lot of traction last year, and now people are going on and on about 545, and you don't hear as much about 556 right now, but mm -hmm. this time last year it's 556, and that kind of goes to show you a little how fickle the market can be. Mm -hmm. But the, in practical terms, I think if companies come out with 556, it'll do better than it has in the past. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's my read on it too, is I think it'll do I think more people will choose a 5.56 five, when more commonly available, but I also don't think it's ever going to supplant 760 by 39. Now, even when we did our couple of 5.45 videos, there were many people in the comments saying, look, I'm just a 7.62 fan when it comes to AKs, and I totally get it. Yep. That said, I really enjoy shooting 5.56 five, AKs. Yeah. I mean, our archers and that, that RPK from Arsenal, that mill, they're, yeah, they're just right. awesome. But the thing is... Aside from a couple of Zastava offerings and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. there hasn't been much. Yeah, so You have a lot better choices in other rifles for 5.56. Yeah, but I'd like to see Arsenal. I'd love to see a Sam, Sam 5, a milled Arsenal import. Sign me up. I'll cool. pay retail. I don't care. Um, I did try this VZ58 in 5.56, but nah, it was better in X39. I agree. Yeah. Uh, David says, hello, are there any issues with keeping a TAPCO trigger in my AK? Jay mentioned something about bolt carrier deformation. Thanks. Well, like the guy was talking just a bit ago about rivet deformation with that AKT. Yeah, whenever you're putting in a U.S. commercial part, you can, you might. The bolt carrier tail thing seems to be real mm -hmm. because it it's been attributed to a couple of things, either the steel of the hammer being too hard or the geometry being on the face wrong but i've only heard of a few cases where it actually impacted function yeah. usually the damage is cosmetic mm -hmm. yeah i think that that goes down to it is if you don't care then it's probably not going to impact you um if you if you're talking about a gun that you want to keep in generally as close to perfect shape as he can while mm -hmm. still also shooting it, it's probably a good idea to change it out. Yeah, like when that started to surface, I immediately pulled the tab coat yeah. out of my archer. Yep. So yep. guns like that that I really prize and, and can't easily replace, 
I will. And I've been slowly, I really like the new, well, it's not new now, but no. the Fime Group triggers. The triggers are good. Yeah. Supposedly, is it the Rack 1 triggers from Century or supposedly good as well? I've Tabco? heard of a few issues like with the Tabco, but they definitely seem to be an improvement. Mm. Now, here's the thing, that, that Tabco G2 actually dates back to Gordon Tech, hence the G2, oh. in the early 21st century, like 20 years ago. So... For that day and time being an early effort for an AK trigger, yeah, it was good. But we, we've gotten better. Yeah, I just always liked the pull on them. Person, I know a lot of people didn't, but I liked how light they were. In the oh yeah, on. I remember when Century went away from their in-house C March trigger groups, the the ones with the narrow bow mm -hmm. and the SAR ones, and they started putting the Tapco in the Wasser Kins. That was late '04 noticeable improvement yeah. because any of you guys who say this AK or that AK has a bad trigger don't talk to me until you've tried those old century triggers <laughs> they were terrible yeah or even a, an original uh, full auto trigger shooting full auto oh, <laughs> man. those are tough as well some anyway um, Joseph says do you still have the ATI Galil Galeo and how well is it shooting now I still love mine had to, fo had to modify the same thing you did. Yeah. I suspect the small cutout in the frame by the trigger guard is not present. The one ATI was selling as standalone had it. Yeah, I mean, that was a early release thing. It was a minor machining thing. Uh, it seems like they fixed it within the first half year and, and no problem. And even then, it was a, something you could tweak at home. And it wasn't every mag. We didn't actually have much mag fitment issues. No, I uh, still don't have, I don't have that one mostly because I've got a, the Jeff Miller AR build and I've got that South African R5. Mm -hmm. And of course I've got a modern IWI. I, I kind of downsized my Galil collection a couple of years ago, probably when I was getting more Swiss guns. Yeah. But Makes sense. Yeah. No, I, I think they're good. I've, I've kind of always, when people ask, said I prefer them over the ones that Classic was selling, mostly because ATI really seemed to care. They kind of had that PSA vibe of where they might make a little mistake early on, but they were willing to admit it, and they, more importantly, were willing to correct it. Yeah. And I like that. Uh, Joseph says, thanks for, thanks for all the hard work, guys. Thank you. Um, this has become my number one channel. Appreciate that, Joseph. <laughs> um, I have a couple questions. What front end conversion parts are compatible with the 762 and 545 Saiga Sporters, and what parts are compatible with the Molot Vepper 545 Sporter? Well, um, generally speaking, Sagas are compatible with your AKM, AK74 front end parts, and the Vepers are compatible with RPK front end parts. The big difference is the heavier barrel, and to some extent, the heavier trunnion and receiver on the Vepper. So yeah, if if I, if I was converting a Sega, I would try to find AK seventy four M, AK one hundred parts. But most of the time, standard AK seventy four and even AKM parts will work. I would say check out Carolina Shooter Supply too, mm -hmm. uh, because they have they have had at least in the past when I converted my Sega four ten, they had some you know decent and fairly inexpensive conversion kits to help get that. And the owner is a he's he's a pretty good dude he um he'll answer questions if you call him he, and he seems to be pretty knowledgeable about stuff yeah. so yeah i recommend them quite a bit and they've they've kind of specialized in that and he can he can kind of tell you your options the biggest deal funnily enough is kind of the handguard retainer on yeah. that front end because yeah you can do the bolt on but if you want to do it right you have to pull your gas block and on Segas especially, but Vepers too, they have those dimple pressed parts. And that, yeah. removing those dimples, mm -hmm. for a good gunsmith, it's not a problem. But for a garage person, you definitely don't want to go too into your barrel. Mm -hmm. So, caveat emptor there. Yeah. Uh, J-Man says, hello. From a business point of view, do you think there's a major difference between people who buy guns online, transfers only, versus people who guy God, who guy buns versus people who buy guns from a, from a brick and mortar store um, I was at a hardware store and they had an Arsenal 545 rifle in stock and the guy said it had been for sale for about four years with no one wanting to buy it the uh, with, the, the gay duo. with the current prices that was on me that was J-Man did not say that with the current prices I picked it up and was surprised even a small mom and pop store would, wouldn't consider posting it on Gun Broker 
Thanks for the content. <laughs> it is always appreciated. Sure. Um, yeah, you're definitely right. There, and that that's kind of how a, a lot of guns that I sell online aren't really great at brick and mortar, and you know, conversely, a lot of the guns that are staples of brick and mortar stores don't sell well online. And I, the, finding a 104 FR that doesn't surprise me at all because on a local level, most people bought those when the seven and six was. 10 cents or cheaper around then they were told the ammo was banned now as we know it was only the military ammo banned and the, you know but they they got out of it then so you can in fact my hometown last year had a 104 fr at a local shop with ammo for like 1800 with a couple of cases of ammo and half a dozen mags which was a pretty good deal so yeah that doesn't surprise me at all and um yeah that's kind of how it is yeah it's just people will look online it's why they don't post on gun broker time energy effort um some people aren't savvy other people don't want to mess with shipping a gun which is a thing in and of itself and sometimes just trying to actually get paid online can be half the battle yeah <laughs> um blake says big fan of the channel thanks blake uh hoping you can shed some light on the following question is the full-size Draco the civilian import equivalent of the PMMD-90? And then he puts the Romanian name here, and I'm not going to even try. If not, what are the differences? I SBR'd my Draco with a Romy folding stock, and curious if that's essentially the semi-auto version of what was used in service. Also, what HDs are correct? Dong, palm swells, or both? Thanks. And that's why I brought this out. Where did I put it? Here it is. This is my Wasserton KR. No, I think I actually grabbed the 90. Grab Oops. Wasser. Oh, well. Well, they're both washers. I just was feeling the bottom. But yeah, this will this will demonstrate anyway. I, I set this washer up with uh, PM90. These are the parts, you know, like when those kits came in. This is the stock. Now, this is the lever style, which is mostly for export. The, the military is for push button. I could have put dong on here, but I went with the palm swell. Yep. Because they do both. And... I don't know, I like palm swell, and a lot of times you do see the, um, the, the palm swell more, but it can be either way, because the thing is, the, the whole PM90, be it the short rifle, which is the 12 inch, or the 16 there, that's a, that's a Cougar factory designation. Not to say that many military doesn't have some, but it's mostly their thing, so they kind of make them in a hundred different ways. And yeah, the Draco is a semi-automatic version of the PM90 short rifle slash AIMR. And yeah, the only real difference is, aside from, of course, the select fire, it has no standard trunnion in the rear, no stock. But yeah, the, the military version has a 14 millimeter threaded barrel, little cleaning rod, short gas system, and they have a really cool looking birdcage flash rider. So yeah, the Draco is basically that. And again, the Wasser 10KR is essentially a carbine import with an extended muzzle brake, which yeah. is surprisingly a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, I like the dong setup on um, my, it's my, what are, what are they called? The DIY? The M plus M, M10, M10 DIY. M10, yeah, that's it, right? Yeah. Um, I like that I put the dong, I put the uh, a folder like that on mine and then a dong front end and I, I really, it's fun. I really like shooting it with that setup. The only problem is changing mags can be a little bit difficult. Like you got to get the right angle to get past the dong. Um, but um, it's like I said, it's a lot of fun to shoot. Yeah, I didn't, so. I didn't put it on either of my PM90s, either that one or the one I meant to grab because it is on my SAR1, which is my PM63 clone. And it's on my SAR2, which is my PA86 clone. So kind of goes to show you they, they did them both ways and yeah yeah um andrew says last question um how, how do you from behind enemy lines near san francisco do either of y'all shoot older smith and one I, I, okay do either of y'all shoot older smith and wesson revolvers regularly we've been out this for like three and a half hours now I have a mid-1950s production Model 36 that is fun to shoot mm -hmm. now that I put a stubby uh, hogue grip on it. Okay. The best part of the older revolvers and somehow new ones is the lack of a hillary hole. Take it easy, guys. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I, don't, I don't really have any revolvers much. Um, I've got a... 
I've got my um, Alpha Proj 357, and then I've got a couple single sixes and some Heritage mm -hmm. uh, single actions. Um, um, and then in a Gaunt revolver, which I don't shoot ever because it's uh, garbage to shoot. But um, yeah, I, I, I do like, I really appreciate the older Smiths for sure. I've shot some of yours, mm -hmm. but it's not something that we shoot very often at all. No, because a lot, I, I, I but you know, you get in revolvers, generally you have Colt people, you have Ruger people, and you have Smith and Wesson. I definitely fall in the Smith camp. I've got a, but I also go for more military guns. I'm not a commercial person. Yep. So I've got a, a 1917 from them. I did have a really cool Model 28-2 that was New York State Police that I basically had to sell a long time ago for different reasons, but I kind of regret that. That was the large end frame. I still have a, a Model 15 2, which is my Ersatz Air Force gun, mm -hmm. and yeah, I really like them. Um, the new ones aren't bad either, though. I've had I had a modern yeah. 686 for a while, and I had a 1981 686, and the new ones get a little bit of a bad rap. I think all in all, they're they're pretty solid guns, but mm -hmm. I do like that. I mean, new revolvers are so pricey, and you can get a lightly used old one for half the deal, and why not? Sure. You know. Yep. Yeah, probably next gun I get will probably be another revolver because I'd like to get something in 357, but it'll be a modern production because I want to be. Yeah, you're more loads through it. Yeah, I've got a I've got a victory uh, from World War II. That's pretty neat. Really like the victories. I think they're under even today kind of underappreciated part of American military history. Yeah, makes mm -hmm. sense. Well, that is the last of the questions. Are you sure? I'm sure. <laughs> no, we really do appreciate it, guys. Yep. And uh, we'll, we'll do another one of these probably towards the end of the summer, hopefully after the lockdown is well and truly over. Yep. Yeah, we're, we're still, right now, as of we're right doing this, we're still in the whole social distancing quarantine phase. Um, so we're not, we haven't gotten out a whole lot lately, but uh, in an effort to kind of... <laughs> help people along, give them something else to watch. We've been doing the Gun of the Day videos. We're still going to be doing Gun of the Day videos. I just recorded five of those yesterday myself. Hmm. I know you recorded a few um, within the last few days. So those will be going up shortly. Um, we'll do, be doing a range trip out on the Ruger 57 pretty yep, quick. And, I'm, I, and uh, has it, it, we're going to be doing on the, on the ZPAP, the new one, the, the 1.5, that, that's in. So we'll be doing a bit on it. Yep. We have some pretty neat stuff planned. Yep. Um, Got this uh, this gun here, which we had to. It was kind of hard to get running because we tried to do a striker fired as we usually do, and it didn't like that. So now we're doing a hammer fired. So that'll be interesting. Uh, first test firing went okay, but yep. we'll see how the day goes. Yeah. So lots of stuff coming up. Yep. We just uh, other priorities, and it's you know we do what we do. But uh, yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, feel free to like, share, subscribe, place any comments. And if you'd like to take part in the next one again, a dollar and up and you can ask as many questions as you want. Yep. For sure. Yeah. yeah. We really appreciate everything. Thanks for all the new subscribers. If you're new to us, yeah. um, for checking us out, stick with us. And also, you know, if you're interested, I, I try to keep the playlist up to date. Now a lot of channels don't, but if you're interested in a specific topic, check out our playlist. Yeah, lots of stuff there. Alrighty, guys, we're going to call it a day. This is Misha. And this is Jake. And we'll catch you soon next time. Bye.